my name's Karen O'Connor and you're listening to Menopause, Marriage and Motherhood, the podcast that looks at all aspects of women's lives from hormones and health to relationships, finance and social justice issues. You can connect with me on social media at at karen.mmn. If you enjoy this podcast or podcast in general, and you've been wondering whether you should start your own podcast, head on over to speakuppodcasting.com to find out just how easy and cheap it is to start podcasting. Now let's get right into it. Hello and welcome. I'm here today with Nina Tom. Welcome, Nina. Thank you, Karen. (laughs) Now, I've got to say something here. Nina Tom is a pen name. Her real name is Nicole, and she's written a a book called, what is the full title? I just know it as Woke. What's the full title? (laughs) (laughs) It's it's called Woke or Not, A Guide to Woke for Older People. You've got all sorts of qualifications, but let's just go into that one now, and they're really varied too. But let's just go into that one now. What made you decide, tell me what the book's about and what made you decide to write the book? Okay, so the book is really a reference guide and it is very specifically for people who don't know a lot about woke. It's a word that's been around and some people are familiar, some aren't. But even if you are familiar, there are a lot of many different perceptions about what it means where it came from and there's even confusion about whether is it a compliment or is it an insult and I got caught up in this myself when I've got adult children who are millennials and I don't know it must have come up in conversation with one of my kids said oh you're so woke mum or you think you're woke and I'm like yeah is that a good thing or a bad thing and that's where it started i just got curious about this topic and when i was looking for a book to write about i was curious to explore the publishing and being an author and wanted to pick a topic that was of interest to me and that i was happy to do some research on and that's i just thought look there must be other people like me who are a bit ignorant or feel a bit left outside of these conversations with their kids or even understanding I don't know if you remember when the Black Lives Matter movement was on the media back in 2016 and 18, and there was so much, there was these slogans, stay woke, and I wanted to know more. I wanted to understand what exactly did that mean. So that's that sort of launched me onto this deep dive into a topic that now I'm more subject matter expert than I thought I would be. So... (laughs) It's funny, isn't it? Because you, earlier this year, I was having a bit of a spat on Facebook with my former next door neighbour, who was being remarkably bullying and sexist. And at one point, he said to me, oh, my God, you're a woke lefty, aren't you? And I went, not entirely sure what woke is, but let's go with that. Because coming from you, it's probably meant as an insult and really isn't. But I don't know much about it. And particularly being in Australia, I think people in America understand it more. But I think the rest of us are just like you say, is that an insult? Or is it a compliment? Or what does it actually mean? I'm not I just knew that if he was hurling that insult at me, it was probably something I needed to embrace. (laughs) So I did. (laughs) I don't actually know the background of it. And and I think that's the issue. Hmm. Because there's so much terminology these days. And There's so many labels that are applied to things to differentiate things because there's so much information. And while the millennials, the Gen Z, all the others might be able to keep up with it, I can't. (laughs) I've got no idea what it means. And you were saying to me about your kids were both like, oh, mum, rolling eyes, don't you understand this? And that's the reaction we get, isn't it? It's there are all this term there is all this terminology that we don't necessarily understand so talk to me i understand why you did it but what happened because it was must have been like opening a bit of a pandora's box <laughs> as, as you started looking into it what happened yes i think initially because of the language this word woke and the more recent 
applications and look to be really just direct about what it means it really is just a word that talks about awareness of social justice issues like that's it's pretty simple it's pretty simple but there's a whole many layers and nuances to it that i had to that i did discover and because it's been more recently used and it's in this culture that sort of focuses more on the millennials and gen z I had the impression this was like some new thing. Oh, like <laughs> they just invented social justice 10 years ago. That's how it occurred. Like it was new. And then when I got into it, I'm like, wait a minute, we're talking about issues about racism. We're talking about discrimination. We're talking about sexism. We're talking about gender issues. These things have been around for quite a long time. We just had different labels for it back when I was younger. And like when I started uni back in the 1980s, <laughs> we called it political correctness. And you probably were called a bit of a lefty or a socialist if you actually expressed opinions that were more liberal. And we've got a very different, it, it's hard because in Australia, we we have political language for left and liberal and that's different to America. So even when you say the word liberal, like for my children, liberal meant conservative. They're millennials talking about liberals and labor as that's the left and right of the political divide. Whereas in America, and this is where they were misunderstanding, no, liberal is quite <laughs> progressive <laughs> compared to conservatives and yeah. there's far more than, <laughs> than what we imagined. So there was even this confusion about the context, the political context and how left is left and how right is right. So it was so confusing, but I did, what I did realize is there's nothing really that new. It's just the language. There's certainly some newer movements and we can get into that a bit later. I think around um, certainly gender issues, uh, uh, there's some new areas where we're developing into and around uh, climate justice is a big issue. Um, within this sort of woke cultural world. Uh, but then there's some historical issues like minorities, racial minorities, ethnic minorities. Still, sexism is present in our culture. So Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because it was, as I was reading the book, I realised that it was the terminology, the new terminology that I didn't understand. As a progressive kind of person like you at university back in the 80s. I was a member of Greenpeace and I joined the marches and those things like we do. But I didn't understand. And really one of the things I knew about woke was, is it down in Florida where they're, they're taking books out of the classrooms and things and telling teachers they can't talk about stuff, the anti-woke movement and I'm a little bit confused about that partly because I don't yet I'm, I'm English Australian I don't understand the American culture that well to get a grip on what's going on but that was I was a bit like okay what's woke in that regard what does it mean and it, it's almost yeah. like Look. It's almost like what we knew back in the 80s has shattered into all of these different little spheres of things that we don't know what we're talking about. <laughs> Does that make sense? <laughs> Thanks, Karen. I think you've dived into the most complex part of it and, I, and it took to me to get through. These are the last parts of the book. This is the last chapters around the anti-woke, reactionary politics and the emergence of the alt, what we call the alt-right, the alternative right. And in America, they, they come under the label of the faith and flag conservatives and we know what we're talking about there I think if you watch the news and it came about at a time in political history when <laughs> when a certain president was elected in America without getting too political about it but it's definitely was driven really driven upward as a bit more of a propaganda exercise in grabbing something that conservatives could see that moderates were conserved about. There was a genuine concern about some of the progressive reforms that were happening in America, and they certainly were around education, certainly around creating safe spaces for gender diversity in schools and workplaces. And there's been a whole raft of reforms that 
over since the 1970s have actually been introduced, not just in America, it's been introduced in Australia, England. Most modern societies in the world have embraced pretty much what we'd call our human rights. Basically, it comes out of human rights. So we have this sort of global system of values that this is what our society and culture aspires to. It does get into the murky waters of religious aspects, but generally the political field, certainly in Western societies, is being centred around a democratic process and democratic rights and the rights of individuals. And a lot of woke reforms really were to keep this sort of social change happening. It's just happened sometimes too quickly. And for a lot of more traditional people, and there that's probably the majority of most voters in most Western countries, most people sit in the middle, there, there were genuine concerns. And unfortunately, politically, you can take a concern, amplify it into a major fear, turn it into some sort of moral panic, and then it gains traction and so on. So in Florida, we had the governor of Florida, Ron DeSantis, took on board this very, this concern and used it as a platform to promote what he would call more moderate approach and slow down and pull back some of this progress that a lot of people actually aren't comfortable with. And so there's, I would never side politically on what's the right approach to that. It's just, that's what you'll see a lot in the media, the very reactionary approach, the reactions to this sort of progressive approach. There's a gazillion ways I want to go there, but because <laughs> I would like to do a dive into why people are, because it, it's almost, like, and I don't know whether I want to go there, I was going to say it's almost like it's turned, that kind of political manoeuvre has turned social justice into the enemy almost, as opposed to, and this was, Oh, I don't know whether I want to get into this, but that is the problem that I see. And that where banning the books and everything in classrooms, that kind of carries on over to social. I'm just making connections in my brain here. That kind of carries on to social media as well, doesn't it? Because we see the cancel culture and the, oh, that's one thing I don't like, or dodgy ground, the calling people out, the bringing yeah. out the truth which isn't, it's your truth. As we all know, there isn't one single truth. <laughs> There's lots of truths. Talk to me about that. What did you find out about that? Yeah, look, that, that's a really interesting part because it's not a part I knew a lot about because I don't engage that much. I'm not on Twitter and I don't engage that much in Facebook. So I'm not exposed to that personally. But what I could see in the media was the, the hoo-ha, all, all the consequences of cancel culture. And I was really curious, where did this come from? Because that definitely is new in the last 10 years. That's a part of this whole conversation that is the new part. And it's this freedom of information. It's a free speech platform. And there's this thing, we call it fake news now, that you could because anyone can say anything and it's not peer reviewed, it's not tested rigorously against any standard of information, pretty much whatever anyone wants to say is out there. And I, and I know more recently there's been a lot of issues with censorship and certain platforms have interceded. That was a great place for me to start. And I do go into a big chapter in this book about cancer culture and how it went from a very, originally, I think it was just a group of people on a, a platform on a Tumblr. I forget what platform it is, to be honest. Not MySpace, but something quite simple. And the whole purpose of, they, they set up a little blog, a little forum. It was about calling out problematic behaviours. That was their intent, that famous people or celebrities were doing like faux pas, like things that would be seen as, oh, that's not very appropriate. And that's how it started, this commentary about what they were seeing. And it just snowballed. It really did. So this phenomenon, we've got this calling out thing where anyone, if you saw something that you didn't like, and whether it was society's conventions or your own personal values, people would just take the liberty of saying what they thought about that, having an opinion. But it became what they call a pylon 
now this is a great term where you started to use your social media platform and your voice and if you were an influencer you had a big voice with a lot of followings when you called someone out you might get thousands of people harassing bullying making statements about a particular person for whatever it is that it was considered what whatever crime it was considered they they had done and look some really i i used three case case studies in the book one was a guy called adam smith who just happened to film himself going through a drive through a chicken of chicken fillet franchise and the franchise had had some very anti-gay policies and he was going through the drive through videoed himself talking to one of the cust the service operator the young girl in the window and making a complaint about this company's approach to gay issues so he was genuinely concerned he sent that video to a few friends unknowingly they uploaded into the big bigger cloud and suddenly he was being targeted for being so inappropriate with the young employee and so he was he became the the person that was called out and he lost his job he had a very paid job and it took him eight years to actually get back into the workforce and he talks openly about his story about just him his naivety of the power and influence of social media when he was genuinely calling out a social justice issue but it became the issue his manner and how he did that there's a lot of pluses and minuses about that and a lot of social justice activists you know the black lives matter movement and people who are very engaged in that would justifiably say it's calling out racist behavior that enables society to address it so it, it's a sort of tool it could be used for good or evil you know? <laughs> and, and it can have consequences that people don't realize that it's uncontrollable you can't contain it so there's been a lot of study about it now it's been around for a while so there's a lot of really interesting research into whether it's calling people to account or whether it's actually just a really punitive way to punish people you don't like i think that's human nature it's both isn't it <laughs> it is <laughs> very human behavior it's just we've got a very powerful tool to uh... the most surprising thing that you found out during this oh that's a good question wow i found a lot of surprising things what was the most surprising <laughs> i think the most surprising thing i did discover was the the whole idea that this is a new phenomenon isn't that new that that was the most surprising thing and it's just got a new label and like we talked about before even now idea of this sort of progressive politics progressive viewpoints i suppose i always associated with the sort of feminist movement back in the 70s and that, that was a little before my time but definitely i was the first generation after in in the sort of gen x's who really got the benefits of the glorious gynams and women who were out there betty friedman women who were out there really promoting the sort of women's liberation and all that but when I did the research, these are concepts that started back in the late 19th century. And there was actually a formal movement of, of progressive politics that really was taking place at the turn of the century. And it was far more violent and controversial and polarized than anything that we would be experiencing today. It was literally a life or death sort of process <laughs> yeah. and uh, yeah that surprised me that we fear we have a lot of fears around progressiveness it was what started back in the late 19th, 19th century early 20th century that formed the absolute foundation of a lot of our stuff that's in society today that we don't even identify we wouldn't even call it progressive it just becomes normal and yeah, it's just when you get to those outer edges of the more progressive ideas, I think there's a lot of challenges around the young kids with the transgender and gender diversity issues and the ba bathrooms and who can go where. That's what it looks like at the outer edges and gender reassignment and things like that. That's the area where it hasn't 
reach that sort of normal zone. But there's so many things we accept now. We, we've, a lot of our language reflects the fact that we don't have the chairman anymore. It's a chairperson. And a lot of politically political correctness from back in the 70s and 80s is now just common everyday language. Yeah, th th those were the things that I found really interesting. And when we normalise something, um, yeah. It's interesting that you're saying that because as you're saying no that, I'm thinking, yeah, I'm thinking that the is a large part of the problem with this reluctance to embrace the progressive thing is does that come from a lack of knowledge of the terminology and of what is required and that it's caught because there's so much terminology these days, it might be easier in a way because, um, because of social media and everything to give something to view it, to, to put a bad light on it because you don't understand it. How much of that is involved? How much is this about people not understanding or certainly older people not understanding something because I'm talking about our age group here because there's all these new terms coming up yeah. and I got no clue what they mean <laughs> yeah and look I think that's the point of why I wrote the book I think a lot of it is miscommunication not understanding the terminology and the sort of the history of how it's all moved how it's evolved it's a very evolving space where we're talking about society it's always evolving and changing and there's always new ideas and trends and and then there's just jargon and for the social justice movement picked up the word woke and ran with it the black lives matter movement really picked it up and ran with it and it was traditionally a black african-american slang word back from the 1930s so it just happened to be a, become a buzzword and now it's just been has all these other multi-layered me meanings that's why i wrote the book i really wanted people who and it's not just older people but even people who really wanted to be clear about what we were talking about and there are some very negative and toxic aspects to what we describe as woke culture, but it's don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. There, there is a lot of, like I said, positive aspects and aspects that are already part of our culture that we just don't realise are already there, that we already have no problem with, but we wouldn't identify ourselves as being woke. For instance, if you've got a particular anti-racist stance, in one camp, you'd be called woke if you were just generally against racism. But you might not identify with some of the other platforms, some of the other issues that other more younger, progressive, woke groups promote. And that, I think, is a common issue in America, certainly, where this large group of the population are moderate. And a lot of them are the Black African American society. They're very pro anti racism, but they still struggle with the gender identity issues. So there's just two very different areas that are all covered under this woke banner, you know. So it's not a it's not everything. You can't just embrace everything. Yeah, it's you might have issues around climate change. You might agree with some parts and not others. Yeah. It, it it's interesting because it's almost like we need a, a dictionary or a translation, something to, that goes from what we understand. Like I am against, we, we've got to sort out the climate change thing, but I'm not an eco-warrior, let's mm. say. I don't know. It's because it's yeah. almost like these terms are thrown at us to stop us, almost, to stop us standing up for it. And they go, no, you're too far left. You're trying to undermine society. Mm. Hang on a minute. I just want... Non, no gender discrimination. I just want no race discrimination. I just want the econ the environment to become your top priority, not profits. And it's and then you get this insult that you don't quite understand thrown at you, and it shuts you up and goes, "Oh my God, no! I don't actually identify with them. Who am mm. I?" It's almost like we're losing mm. that understanding of terminology and difference and everything because we're getting this stuff thrown at us that we don't understand 
Yeah, and look, I think what you're describing, and I do allude to it a bit in the in those sort of end chapters where I really get into the nuances here. There's a process called othering, and that's where a group can target another group and turn what may seem as reasonable views and opinions to be held but slip them on their head and make them look like they're extreme or that they're abnormal or that they're deviant. And this is a sort of political tactic that's been going on for decades and it's most, in a way, it, it, it comes from a sort of, and I don't want to get too political here, but it's very much the totalitarian regime tactics. It's very much the tactics of a, a fascist sort of approach where if we just abnormalise the thing that everyone considers normal, we can shift the dialogue, we can shift society's perception of that thing so that the thing that was considered very appropriate and useful, and we're talking about some fundamental human rights issues here, can be turned over into, no, these are extreme or they're ludicrous or they're, you'd have to be really stupid to think that. And that's the process that's been happening in the last few years around a lot of these social justice issues and people who have genuine concern and want to advocate for these issues are now targeted and labelled as extremist. Mm. A, a lot of younger people are just labelled as stupid and ignorant and young, that being a, Or there's just so many ways this can be twisted. And it's got to this absurd thing where there's now a sort of a, a white supremacist, the idea that the white people are the victims now in the racial conversation so it's really flipped racism over oh, oh oh now the white people are being discriminated it's just there's a certain craziness to all that but it is a very common phenomenon in political influencing and how to maneuver and shift society viewpoints so we're, we're just in that phase right now it's very interesting how that's happening and uh, that's why i'm really curious that's why i really wanted to get a background to it to just not be at the whims of other people's propaganda or, or I really wanted to get underneath what's being said and understand the reasoning behind it. So that, that was one of my motives for writing the book. And how did you do that? How did you get underneath everything and find everything out? <laughs> A lot of research, let me tell you. What I thought was just going to be this little, yeah, I'll just start doing a bit of research on some words like non-binary and intersectionality and oh, the pronoun thing. That, that started with why people got she, her and that on their Zoom call. <laughs> like it was just a fairly light, light, light thing. But the more I started the research and the more I researched, the more, and I wrote I probably three drafts of the book. There's probably, there's two books that never ever made it to the final revision phase because I noticed my own shift start to move the more I understood and the more I researched. I have a huge number of references at the end of the book and that is the most abridged version that I could include. <laughs> I, th I was worried there'd be more references than actual text in the book. In my referencing software, I've got 576 references. <laughs> I did a lot of research, a lot of deep diving into the blogs. The I had to subscribe to so many newspapers to get both the pro-woke, anti-woke viewpoints. I really wanted to understand both sides of the different positions that people sit in. And you see the very pro-woke, you're in the middle or you're anyway. But there's three sort of broad positions. And I'm definitely, this book's for those who are in the, I have no idea what this is about and may not even know that they're woke or any woke or either or. And I think that's what I discovered for myself too. I, I was actually very actively engaged and have been for many years in social justice reform. And I was very active in the Me Too movement and went through my own quite public case that, that was addressing historic child sex abuse and went through a court process and all of that. So I was a person actively engaged in social justice, but I never, ever associated myself as woke. I didn't, that word just didn't even connect until I started researching the Me Too movement and understood, wait a minute, my activist, my, what happened, what I was doing was actually a direct result of 
the publicity and that around the Me Too movement. That was interesting. Hmm. It is fascinating, isn't it? Because as you say in that, I'm thinking, yeah, it's, and that was what I didn't understand about this comment from my neighbour because he's calling me woke and I'm like, but I'm just against sex discrimination. I'm just telling you not to bully women. I'm telling you hmm. I, I want to sort out the environment. How does that make me woke? Because that's not who I, woke is this, I don't know. <laughs> picture a, a sort of hippie, aging hippie academic <laughs> that's interesting isn't it everyone everyone has a different perception of a woke what what a woke person is <laughs> depends which media you've been reading <laughs> and it, it's a yeah. it, world but i don't the kids have no problem with it but i don't understand it and that's think is a lot of the issue when we don't understand something we are naturally very reluctant to take it on hmm. yeah and look after doing the research and getting clear of where my position is I have no problem with the word woke and even if it's used in a negative context it doesn't mean that's what I take it to mean yes. I'd be proudly woke <laughs> to, to be honest and your neighbour may subscribe to a particular news that has it in a very negative context relating to the anti-woke legislation in America and a certain certain viewpoint. And, and that's the problem too when you, because we know in the world of social media and the algorithms they use, when you subscribe to certain things, you'll get more of the same. And we've got this thing called the, the cognitive bias principle that the more you see and the more you, that confirms your own viewpoint, the stronger that viewpoint becomes. It's part of the phenomena of our current communication. You know. So what is would be the one thing that you'd want people to understand? Even if they didn't read your book, what would you want to communicate to people? Woke is simply a word. <laughs> and it does have many meanings and nuances but it's important for you to decide for yourself what it is and how you want to perceive it so take it as an insult or take it as a compliment that it, it, it's your choice how did somebody call you're living in a small community and somebody called you woke how what would you recommend would be somebody's to that um, you know, like my neighbour did to me. I'm so glad I don't have to go to street barbecues with him anymore. But how do you respond to that kind of thing? Look, personally, I would laugh it off. It would be the same as just someone calling me a crazy old lady or an opinionated person. If someone wants to insult me, it's very clear in their tone and their manner that they're insulting me. And whether I want to take that personally or not is up to me. So it, it's just another word that can be wielded and used. And I and I think you'll get the subtext behind the word as to know what the context of the conversation is. In, in some environments, that, that word's going to be used in a very empowering way. And that's how I choose to hear it. So some really awful moments when you were researching this book and some really incredibly hopeful or good feeling moments when you were researching it T talk to me about those two look the awful moment was putting out my first draft to my daughter to read because it's like one thing to be in your own little head working away writing what you think is a really good book and then putting it out for review and criticism. And I know my daughter is a very, very socially aware and person who's proactive in this space. So if anything was going to come up, it, she'd be the one to pick it. And so that was just the first, she was my first beta reader. And I did have to, it's like when you start to share what you're writing, and are you hitting the mark or not? And, and what is the response going to, going to be? So I was really scared of 
oh my gosh, am I just showing how ignorant and stupid I really am about this? And that's why I said my first draft was a bit of a clanker. It really outed my own quite, not that enlightened viewpoint. I could see, even in the writing and the feedback, that I was not coming from a neutral place. I actually, there was a lot of prejudiced beliefs and opinions in there. So just putting yourself out to critique is scary. And when I hit the, when you publish, when you go public, that's a scary moment because suddenly you're, I'm just another player in a field where there's a lot of opinions about this out there and you're open to criticism and feedback and it may be unkind or it may be <laughs> helpful. Yeah. That, that's interesting because you were saying to me the other week that when you were doing your research just before publishing, there's a lot of anti-woke books, but there's not a lot yes. of books that explain what it actually is. Yeah, there, there was this void. That's when I wrote the book. There was a real void for, for something that wasn't politically motivated or a lot of the Annie Wake books are very ironic or satirical. I think there was one book written by, it was completely fake. Let's write this book to make fun of wokery by pretending to be a real woke person. It, it, it was such a parody of a lot of the viewpoints. And I, and I found that really disturbing that a lot of those viewpoints are held by a large majority of younger people today. And I say to people my age or older, look, you might not agree or understand these principles, but that's our future. In 10 years, 20 years' time, millennials, millennials will be running the country, whether you like it or not. You can make fun of them now, and history will show possibly that, yeah, you might just have been on the ignorant side, and, and, and in 20 years' time, all these things that we're talking about today that are a little bit controversial will be normalised. It will just be everyday common experience. So. Yeah. Oh, and what was the best thing that you discovered in all this? What was the most heartening and uplifting thing? I think that I've been woke all along and I just didn't know it. <laughs> 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 that it really brought me back to, like I said, I was very much in the space of advocating for women's rights and I've been a very strong advocate for having safe spaces for children and children just growing up without sexual abuse and certainly institutional sexual abuse was a big issue that I wanted to address so it really brought me back to the core of why why I was so engaged in those conversations and that it is built on a history I was brought up back in the 70s and 80s you're standing on the shoulders of giants the breakthroughs the, the people that really led the way and you can go back to Martin Luther King and civil rights movements and and the suffragette movement back in the early 1900s when I did the research and understood this has been a long journey I'm just one little piece of a very long journey and I'm proud to be a part of that so I hope whatever I contribute my next books will be testament to my contribution and, and that I'm part of some broader social change just talking of that, take me back. You said something a few minutes ago that when you put your first draft out, you, your daughter, you realised just how ignorant and prejudiced you were. Talk to me about that bit. Just give me a couple of examples. Out of um, that. Well, it helped, it helped me explain her viewpoint, and I didn't always agree with it, but I could see why she would think I'm so prejudiced or there was, there's a misunderstanding at both ends. It's not just old people misunderstanding younger people. It's younger people not realising they're, they're coming from their current views are built on this backbone of, of progressive change that's been going on for a long time and that we've all been, we all, whether we know it or not, have been part of. It was a really useful insight into how the younger generation, the millennials and Gen Z, view the older generation, and I could see why why they react to some of the things we say <laughs> and do. Yeah, it was very interesting her her comments and her the way she took some of the things I said, even though I didn't intend intend them that way. Hmm. Wow, that's interesting. Is there anything? We're going to wrap hmm. up in a minute. Is there anything? else sure. that you'd like to say to people and how can people contact you how can they get in touch with you and where can they buy the book sure basics are the book is called 
woke or not, question mark. It's under my pen name, Nina Tom, which is T-H-O-M. And you'll find it on Amazon. It's released as a Kindle. You can order a paperback or it's soon to be an audio book as well. And the, the official launch will be in a few weeks in mid-November. But it's available now if you wanted to purchase that. And I'm looking for reviewers right now, people to actually what we call advanced reviewers. So people to read it, review it would be great and leave a review on Google, not on Google, on Amazon. And yeah, so that's that's a really important message I'd like to put forward. I'd be really interested in if you had any personal feedback for me. And certainly you could contact me at admin at part three with the number three part3publishing.com and I'm more than happy to yeah respond and if you have concerns or ideas for the book revisions because it's such a changing space and I can foresee look we're going to have a there'll be an election next year in America this whole conversation is going to be very relevant and I would say to people if you want to actually be on the page to be able to have a conversation with others and especially maybe your children or your grandchildren this book will give you the fun, it'll bring you up to speed, up to 2024 at least. That's why I wanted it as a resource. Just so you've got the history, you've got the background, you've got all the definitions of what social justice is, social activism, all the different movements, case studies, the issues today, the conflicts, the toxic aspects of it, the good aspects of it, and um, really a bit of a, a guide of if you want to engage in conversation that's productive, non-confrontational and supportive to the people around you who may be, you know, very socially active or want to be, that there's tips and hints on how to do that. So, Thank you so much. This has been great. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity and it's scary too because I don't know what the response will be. It's when you mention the word woke in any space, it's, it, it, it could trigger a lot of things for a lot of people. So. Yeah, I hadn't thought of that. That bit must be scary. Hats off to you for doing it because that's taken a lot of courage. <laughs> I've got an element of safety. I'm not on Facebook and I'm not on Twitter. So. <laughs> yeah, there's a little bit of a, a protective layer there. <laughs> Thanks so much, Nicole. It's been great. You're welcome. Thank you. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe and rate and review this podcast and share it with your friends. And don't forget, if you've been thinking how great it would be to have your own podcast so that you can interview guests and speak to people about the topics that you're interested in personally, head on over to speakuppodcasting.com to find out just how easy and cheap it is for you to start podcasting. There's a download on how to start a podcast for free waiting there for you. Thank you so much for listening. I'll see you next time.